What's your belief on holidays and birthdays? Excellent question. Um, when we talk about holidays uh, and birthdays, I'm going to give you a tiered response because they are in different tiers. The first tier gets to be those things like, for example, Halloween. We as Muslims do not celebrate Halloween. And I believe if you look at the early writings of the church fathers, there was also something that was condemned in the Christian tradition. Because this holiday comes out of a pagan ritual, something that was people who used to worship other than the one creator, the one Lord of Jesus or Moses or Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Rather, whether if you take it the Druid roots or others, there were devilish, uh, any connotations to it, um, trick or treat wasn't as innocent as we make it out to be nowadays. So we as Muslims would not participate in a pagan ritual. Um, if you talk about Christmas, then the 25th of December, as you guys are well educated, was not historically not the birthday of Jesus. Most, at least from my reading, most uh, biblical scholars would put the birth of Jesus to be somewhere in the summer, depending on some of the scriptures and writings that are there. Rather, Saturnalia was a pagan festival before the time of Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, that was incorporated by one of the early popes into the Christian faith. So we would not celebrate something that has a pagan root. Right? We do have celebrations. Those that are ordained in the Quran, for example, we have Eid al-Adha, which is after the Hajj is completed. And in that, we remember what happened with Abraham and the sacrifice that was to be and that never got to be because it was just a test, we know. But we remember that and we sacrifice and give out the meat to the poor and needy and others to help people around the world as well. So those religious festivals that are based on prophetic history ordained in the Quran, we celebrate. We also have Eid al-Fitr, which will be coming in about a month and a week from now, at the end of the fasting month of Ramadan. And you guys will all be welcome. I'm going to take the liberty to invite you on behalf of Abba Billah. And, uh, you know, so these, these are based on actual tradition. Then you get into things that are incorporated into religious faiths from the outside with uh, either pagan roots or other things like this. We do not celebrate those. Birthdays, for example, we don't find anything in the Old Testament or the New Testament or in the Quran that would justify birthdays. Rather, in the Old Testament, the, the, the indication is given that this was something done by the pharaohs against the people of Israel. This was done um, as a self-celebration. And if you look at the Satanic Bible, not that you should, but if, if academically, if you do want to look at it, they uh, find that to be the most important festivals for the sake for a Satanist, because it is the most self-centered. Right? So we do not believe that birthdays were something that were celebrated by Jesus or Moses or Abraham or David or Muhammad, peace be upon them, so we do not celebrate them. Rather, we stick to the celebrations that are there with prophetic uh, background and divine scripture. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. If you want to give me a gift any other time, I'm open. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Go ahead. Sheikh, could you explain why it's necessary for a follower of Islam to participate in Hajj? And what about the man or woman who just can't afford to do it? That is a great question. And you guys are on it. I like it. Um, why is it obligatory on a Muslim to participate in the Hajj and what about somebody who is unable to afford it? First thing, the Hajj is something that Allah ordained in the Quran. Like we in our religious tradition, we always go back to the evidences. When Allah ordained something or the Prophet, peace be upon him, upon him, shows it to us, then this is something that we follow. Allah ordained in the Quran. The Prophet, peace be upon him, showed us how to perform the Hajj and he ordained it upon us. He said Islam is built on five pillars and one of them being the Hajj. So that is why. But there is a wisdom to it that I want to share. Right? Which is in Hajj, we go to where Abraham went, where Ishmael was. We see that common ancestry of humanity. Right? As Christians, as Jews, uh, as Muslims, we all believe in Abraham. We all believe in Ishmael. We believe in Isaac. We believe... We as Muslims uh, also believe in Jesus, I mean, even if some of the Jewish faith do not. And we believe uh, that these were all prophets sent by the same God. So when we go to those locations, 
and we see where Abraham stood, and we see the house that he built for the worship of the one creator, it connects us with those earlier prophets. Right? We are not just believers in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We believe in all the prophets. The Quran tells us that you cannot differentiate between them. Meaning you cannot say, I believe in Muhammad, but I don't believe in Moses. No. If any Muslim does not believe in Jesus, does not believe in Moses, does not believe in Abraham, does not believe in Adam, does not believe in Noah, he cannot be a Muslim. That is a part of our faith. So in Hajj, we see that connectivity. Secondly, in Hajj, when we go here, you see some of the brothers, like Abu Abdullah, you see, he's stylish. He dresses well, right? Some of the brothers, not going to point anybody out. I'm just kidding. Right? Um, they may not dress as well. Right? Some of you are dressed in very, very nice, well, I mean, I can tell expensive clothing. When we go for the Hajj, we don't have that distinction anymore. We wear as many two pieces of unstitched cloth. So now you cannot differentiate between somebody from Mexico and somebody from Pakistan. Somebody from Finland, from somebody from New York. I mean, you look at people and you just see that we're all humans. In the end, we're all the creation of, uh, of one creator. And it bonds you. We don't have uh, that this is a king, so he doesn't have to wear the ihram. He can go in a robe with gold, and this is a poor person, so he's gonna wear. No! Even if you're a king, even if you're a president, I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat or Green Party or Libertarian or whatever you may be. You, if you're Muslim and you go for the Hajj, you wear the same thing. You go to the same places. It's not like I can do my tawaf somewhere else. No. So it also unites humanity away from the distinctions that we have today. We judge people as this is part of psychology. Whether we are able to overcome our biases or not, we judge people. We look at somebody and how they're dressed and how they speak and think and we judge people. There we get to realize that in the end we're all the same. When I was in Hajj in 2000, the first time I went, I met a Muslim from Djibouti. And I love geography. I was actually, I used to win geography bees and things, but I honestly was thinking, man, I don't think I've ever thought about where that is. And I met, a, which is a part of this in Eastern Africa. And I met a Muslim from Finland. And I really didn't realize there were Muslims in Finland, you know. And those two, one from a remote area in Eastern Africa, and one from Northern Europe, who had never met, who didn't know each other, who couldn't speak the same languages, they were sitting together, waiting the same thing, going to the same rituals, the rituals that were known from Abraham and, and Ishmael and Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon all the Prophet. So you see that unity that it brings. So that is some of the wisdoms and benefits from it. The second part of your excellent question, what if somebody is unable to go? They can't afford it. And it's, especially nowadays, it's not cheap. Allah never puts a burden upon anybody more they can, than they can bear. That's in the Quran. Right? Allah never ordains on somebody more than they can bear. So if you are unable to go financially or physically or due to other constraints, maybe you have elderly parent that cannot be left, you're the sole caregiver or whatever that reason may be, you are not obligated to go anymore. And you're not sinful. If you are able to afford it, and you're physically capable, and you have no other uh, legitimate reason that you cannot travel, there's not war or something like this, then yes, as Muslims, we must go. To, to see that unity, to remember those prophets, to fulfill this obligation. But if somebody's under age, maybe they're 12, 13, they cannot go by themselves. They don't have the ability. They don't have to go. If you cannot financially support it, you don't have to go. Maybe you don't feel that there is safety. Maybe you're in a war torn country. You don't have to go. When a woman doesn't have mahram, this doesn't have to go. Only when you have those abilities, then they become obligatory. And if you don't, you're not sinful. Because Allah never burdens a person more than they can handle. Great question. All right, let's keep going, let's have some fun. Go ahead. So as a bishop from the Church of Jesus Christ, um, how can we um, work, our peoples work together to do good with you guys? Excellent, first thing, I appreciate you being here as a bishop from the Church of Jesus Christ. Um, as the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, showed us when he was in Medina, 
to work together first and foremost for security and safety of where we live. Secondly, to work together towards calling towards that which is right and forbidding from what is evil. The evils in society we all know and the trends in society towards immoral actions and things that we both would condemn from a religious perspective, we know about. So for us to work together to ensure that those divine laws, uh, whether it is the family structure, whether it is having to take care of the needy, whether it is to uh, help from these aspects of homelessness or whatever, these are things we should work together on. Secondly, what you're doing right now, communicating, coming, visiting, talking, from a way of respect, from a way of uh, inner, uh, exchanging of ideas, understanding. Myself, I grew up studying religion. I, I used to go to a Christian Bible studies uh, when I was young, and I studied the Bible cover to cover. I have mine, I have this my secondary copy, but if you see my primary copy, there's no place except that there are stickies and notes and highlights. And we would like to share with you to read the Quran today as a gift from me. Every one of you will get a Quran. If you don't have one, you have one today as a gift. We want to open up those lines of communication. We know most of us as Muslims, we know about a lot of the things that we have in common with our Christian or Jewish neighbors. Okay? Many of the things we need to work together on that. Society, and I'm not going to get too explicit. I don't want to offend uh, uh, any atheists or so on. But society in general, and it's not so much in Utah, but if you come to visit California, you'll see, is going towards a lot of corruption. A lot of things that are going to be harmful for our children being raised in this society. And we as people who do believe in God, we as people who do believe in a moral code, who do believe that there is such a thing as morality, we need to work together in the things that we have in common to defend what is right, to forbid from what is evil. Right? Those kinds of things that we need to work together, get to know each other. Uh, my neighbors in San Diego are Mormon, right? and we have great conversations. We have talks about everything very openly and very honestly, and obviously there are things we're going to disagree on. Even amongst Mormons, you're going to have things you disagree on. Amongst Muslims, we have things we disagree on. Amongst Christians, you have things that we disagree on. But that does not, that should not stop us from discussing and promoting the things that we do agree on. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, why Muslim women wear this hijab? And is there another religion, Christian or Jewish, originally uh, God asked the woman, Christian woman, to wear hijab? Is that really a question or is it not <laughs> Good question. Uh, why do Muslim women wear the modest clothing that would be called hijab? And has that been in earlier or other religious traditions? Yes. Um, I will first answer that from an Islamic perspective, which women, Muslim women are honored by the uh, modest dress in the Quran. And in the Quran, it is not an authority of a man over a woman or uh, something like, for example, when she gets married, she starts to wear. Rather, the Quran says that this so that they can be known as free, as honorable women. So it is to dignify and honorable. If we are to speak um, openly and honestly and not with political correctness, and I'm going to apologize ahead, especially to the masjid here, because I, I speak raw. That's where I'm from, that's how I keep it. Um, most people believe in a hypocritical stance nowadays. Men will come to women and say that I, I don't look at women to lust. I only uh, you know, believe in thinking of her as a great person, but they're usually lying. <laughs> Sorry guys, I'm gonna out you guys. Um, when we see women dressed in a uh, tiny bikini and so on, most men, unfortunately, and you can look at uh, site, I mean, peer-reviewed journals, studies and so on, they evaluate the woman on her physical body. And they think of her as that. I mean, here we see women dressed much more modestly, which is great. But if you go to the San Diego, to the beach, you will see a whole different ballgame. 
What happens there is now a woman becomes a object of man's lust. And that's why if you see commercials, you see women dressed in very uh, inappropriate clothing, even though it's a chewing gum commercial or it's a car commercial. It's got nothing to do with the subject, but it's used as a marketing tool. It's used to make a, a person into an object. And in Islam, we condemn that. Our Muslim sisters, they dress modestly. So when they speak, we have to listen to what they're saying and appreciate them for their intelligence and for their faith and their dignity, not for their measurements. We don't set up this kind of a society where a woman feels that she's not good enough because she doesn't look like uh, a particular model on TV and we have people trying to make themselves throw up and surgeries just to try to fit a mold that they shouldn't have to. In Islam, we believe in that. And, and this is not just for women. As you see, none of us are sitting here in biker shorts and uh, you know, bikinis for men either. We dress modestly. We dress in a way that's dignified. And this is not something unique to Islam. I mean, as I said, I will speak from a Muslim perspective because something ordained in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. If we look at uh, the Bible, we find verses where women are ordered to cover their hair while prophesizing or preaching. And if not, then their head would be shaved. But if that is shameful, for them to cover. And we find in the earlier traditions, if you look at depictions of early Christians, you will not find them walking around in mini skirts and things like this, but rather in a modest dress, head covering and so on. And you will find this in some of the other religious traditions, like for example, Catholic nuns, even though it's somewhat going away today. And earlier than that, and you will find this in the Jewish scriptures. Now, the, the, some of the rules and regulations are a little bit different. Like in the Jewish scriptures, for example, the covering of the head starts from after marriage. And in the Bible, for example, it's shown as the authority of man on woman, right? So on. So those are a little bit different. In Islam, it's a little bit different. But that tradition can be found in many religious traditions in the past. And till today, uh, even if you look at the uh, LDS uh, traditions, you will see a very modest dress. And this is something that I think we should always work together on, is to preserve society and the modesty in society. Thank you. Go ahead. Actually, regarding this issue, regarding the cover of the head, one time my wife accompanied me to the university here, Florida State University, and some student asked her, why you put it that like this? She told them, very good answer, I think. She told them that in our Quran, Mary mentioned 33 times in our Quran. And our Quran considered her the most purified woman since here until the hereafter. And I like, extremely like Mary. Could you please let me know one picture or a statue of Mary without covering the head? So I would like to follow this kind of thing. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Timothy has a question over there. Uh, right, Timothy? It was actually asked already. By oh, was it? Yes, it was about five. Oh, was it? So yes. Mike beat you to it? Yes. He does that often, by the way. <laughs> Any other questions? We will not be offended by you. Go ahead. No, I have another question that goes along with the hijab. So some women cover their mouths as well when they're around other men. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain more why some do and some don't? Sure. So the base order in the Quran is jilabihinna, an outer cloth that they used to have to draw it together to cover their bodies. This is the base in the Quran. From that now, the scholars of Islam, looking at the practices of the, the wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, or the women in the companions, they derived rulings. Some of the scholars of Islam, they took the ruling that in front of the man that is not related to you. So just to be clear, Muslim women do not cover at home, right? So when we have, and, and which is different from the Jewish faith. In the, as I studied uh, some of the Jewish from the, at least the rabbi that I uh, spoke to and read from, they have a covering even at home, even when sleeping, even when they're with their husbands, which is kind of strange for us, but we... Yeah. So, 
A Muslim woman, when she's with her husband, when she's with her father, when she's with her husband, when she's with her children, when those that we call mahram, from the close family relatives, she does not have to wear that cover. When she's outside in a place where there may be males who would look at her from a lustful perspective, then she does. So what is the boundary? Some of the scholars of Islam, they said that the face and hands can show. And some of the scholars, they said that no, because sometimes the face is a point of beauty, that the face should also be covered, right? So there is a disagreement amongst the scholars of Islam. Whichever opinion people take based on the evidences, we respect that. Lady in the back. Do young girls cover? Excellent question. The young girls cover. The covering begins uh, as an obligation once you reach past the age of puberty. When, so if somebody is a five, six year old girl, she doesn't have to cover. Because usually in a good society, the lust will not be looking at the girls of that age. But when you look at girls who go past when they're at the age of beauty and so on, meaning past the age of puberty, here the covering comes into play. Any other questions? So it's not when they get married. It is not when they get married. That's a great question. Um, the covering being related to the husband or marriage is found in the Jewish traditions, not in the Islamic tradition. So if a woman never gets married, she still covers once she reaches that age of puberty. If a woman is uh, married and divorced, for example, she still covers. That has, that has nothing to do with a man or her husband or her father uh, or her brothers. It is a direct relationship between her and her kids. Let's ask some more, come on. Got some good ones, go ahead. Uh, Shaykh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Sufism. Sufism? Great question. Um, as Muslims, we have one Islam. We don't have two, right? Islam is one. What is Islam? Qala Allah wa qala Rasul, alayhi salatu salam. Whatever Allah has ordered in the Quran, and whatever the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, has been authentically established from him, that is Islam. We don't have branches in Islam. There are sects that deviate, right? Meaning the Quran, I'll give you a little example that we'll get to Sufis in particular. The Quran tells us that if you take the life of one person unjustly, it is as if you killed all of mankind. That is the Quranic order, right? But there may be Muslims who deviate away from that, like what we call the Khawarij, who kill people unjustly. We as Muslims condemn that. We say that is not Islam. What is Islam? What Allah has ordered in the Quran, and what the, has been authentically established from the Prophet That's Islam. Past that, you have sects that deviate, whether it is due to political purposes or uh, lack of knowledge or so on, and we have this deviation that came early on from a people that started to wear rough clothing. They wanted to show that they didn't have a love for this worldly life, so they would start to wear wool. Suf, wool. That's where the word Sufi, according to the scholars of Islam, comes from. But we know the Prophet, peace be upon him, wore other than just wool. He didn't just restrict himself to that. So we do not agree with this. Right? In fact, the hadith in Ibn Majah, in the book of Ibn Majah, which you have here in the library, the Prophet ﷺ, he wore wool one time and he didn't like it because wool keeps the smells warm. Right? So, we as Muslims say you cannot make your own isms. When you're Muslim, you're Muslim. Whether it's Shiaism, whether it's Qadianism, or Ismailism, or Sufism, or this ism, or that ism, we see these as deviations. We as Muslims are one body. We have one Quran, we have one Prophet, we have one Ummah, this is it. Right? That grew from that early, somewhat harmless, but yet still rejected uh, method to people who made almost a different religion. Right? From that, Sufism grew out, Baha'ism and some other deviant sects and so on, where they started to take it to a level where they would say something like, Allah is billah in everything, right? And they would worship other than Allah and say that Allah is in a tree and Allah is in this and Allah is in that and Allah is in me and Allah is in this. We as Muslims reject all of that. We stick to the Quran and Allah tells us that there is a 
There is nothing that is even comparable to Allah. Right? What do we say about Allah? What Allah says about Himself. If Allah says in the Quran, Rahmanu al Arsh is this is what we say. If the Prophet said that Rabbuna, the Nuzul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Akhir al that's what we say. That's it. We don't say there's a hidden meaning and there's this meaning and that meaning and all that stuff. Islam is one reason. If by Sufism somebody is referring to uh, meditation in the sense of remembering Allah, making dhikr according to the Sunnah, then there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not Sufi, that's Islam. That's just a part of the way the Prophet taught us. How to be a good person, how to cleanse your heart from uh, showing off and from the diseases of the heart. Khalas, that's Islam. Right? Why, why make a sect? Why make a different? Like, what's the difference between a Sufi and a regular Muslim? So we reject all the isms. We say stick to what Allah has revealed in the Quran. And the best example is the Prophet Good? More questions? Okay, hold on. Let me uh, send a mic to you, or, or can somebody hear and. Uh... I have. Yes, I can. Beautiful question. The question is, how strict are the requirements for the five daily prayers and how those prayers are set? Um, the five daily prayers are obligatory. They are something that every Muslim must do to the best of their ability. Once again, um, if a Muslim is unable to stand and pray, there's no sin on them, they can sit and pray. If they cannot sit and pray, they can lay down and pray. To their size, whatever they are able to. From that ability, they're obligatory. And again, another good question, which was not for children. If you are very young, you're not going to tell a three year old you got to pray five times a day, <laughs> they're too busy playing, right? So when you reach a certain age, you start to, to, to instruct our children to pray. And at the age of puberty, past that, it's an obligation. Now, those prayers are a very practical reminder for us, for our purpose in life, for our Creator. Because as we know, people get tempted throughout the day. You go, you're working, you start, somebody's like, you might want to say this to sell the car, and you're like, ah, should I do it? You know? But when you go, and then you pray, and then you realize that I'm standing in front of my Creator, my Creator listens to me, my Creator sees me, it kind of brings that check. So it's a very essential part of the daily life of a Muslim. The prayers are five. So we have Fajr, Subh, which is the early morning prayer, which here is, you know, around 6 a.m. they pray it here. Um, it's not like at 6 and 6.05 you have to pray. No, you have a, a span of time and the prayer, the Fajr prayer takes you a few minutes. It's only two units. And you have the span of time where you can pray that prayer. So it's a very practical thing. So, for example, if you wake up and you're about to get up for your morning jog and, or you're about to go to work, you have those few hours of a gap. In that, you say a few minutes of prayer, it catches you. Then you have the next prayer, which is Dhuhr. Dhuhr, the, you can say the midday prayer. When the sun, when it's at the zenith, when it starts to have a shadow, the prayer starts all the way till the shadow is equal to itself. So that would, and depending on where you are, you can have a few hours there as well to say a four, five, six minute prayer. So again, you have this very practical time frame where you can say this prayer, but now midday, it reminds you again. The next prayer is Asr, from when the shadow equals itself to when the sun sets. Here again, you have a few hours, you have this time to pray again. It's only four units, it'll take you a few minutes. 
if you're at work, obviously every two hours, I mean, in America, you get a 15 minute break, uh, you know, you have lunch time, you have those times, you can easily pray. If you are unable, let's say you are a heart surgeon, you're in the middle of surgery and somebody's gonna die if you go here, it's okay, you can even combine prayers at certain times. Right? Why? Because Islam is a very practical religion. If you're traveling, if it's raining and it's night and things like this, there are certain situations. And the Imam can explain those in detail. I'm just giving a summary here. What you are allowed to even combine out of necessity, out of certain conditions. Then you have the evening prayer, which is when the sun sets until it becomes completely dark. And then the night prayer from the darkness till the middle of the night. This is the preferred time for the night prayer. So each prayer you have a large time gap to say a short prayer so that it's practical. But as a Muslim, you must. This is something that's obligatory, it's fault. It's an obligation on Muslims to pray five times a day. And the method of prayer is laid out by the Prophet, peace be upon him, himself. Huh? The Rasulullah, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Sallu kama yusalli. Pray as you see me praying. And you will find this in the Bible as well. You will find when Jesus, for example, put his head to the ground, you find Abraham and Moses putting their head on the ground and praying as well. But the details of that are listed in the books of Hadith. And this is the, who, who were with us in the library. We saw that beautiful 52 volume Muslim Imam Ahmad. This is a book of Hadith. So it gives you every detail, how the Prophet folded his hands, how did he bow, where did he put his hand, where did he put his forehead, what did he recite in which part of the prayer, and scholars like what you have with the Imam here, Shaykh Muhammad, they are experts in this. So we as Muslims, we come to the scholars and we learn from them how to say the prayer. Now, in certain things, there is leeway. For example, let's say uh, if, uh, whether I put my hands first while going in or, or my knees first and so on. But the essentials of the prayer, how many units for Fajr being two, Dhuhr being four, Asr being four, Maghrib being three, Isha being four, all the Muslims agree on this. And how do we pray? We stand, Qiyam, recite Al-Fatiha, Ruku, Sujood. All of this is well known, documented from the exact practice of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And that's one of the things that really attracted me to Islam. As I said, growing up, I was not raised in a very uh, traditional Islamic family or the Islamic tradition. I had no Muslim friends. I've been to everything from Kingdom Halls to Catholic churches to Southern Baptists. Uh, I was in churches that they handle snakes and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, uh, but I, I really loved one aspect of Islam, that everything was based on the actual practice of the Prophet, peace be upon him, or the Quran itself. I used to go to a Catholic church because a lot of my friends were Catholic. Uh, the Mexican uh, people are majority Catholics, even though there is obviously every faith there as well. And a lot of the practices, like when we used to go for confession or things like this, I did not find in the Bible. And I would ask them, you know, how come the Pope wears red shoes? Like, where does that come from? The white smoke? You know? And it would just be like, it is the way it is. You know? Why do we pray? Why do I sit and open my mouth for some dude to put a cracker in my mouth and all this? And, you know, did Jesus put a cracker in people's mouths? Like, no. Like, okay. So, all of that was kind of different. But in Islam, the whole prayer from beginning to end, we can show you from the authentic sources. Right? Not just that somebody says the Prophet prayed that way. No, as we were discussing earlier, there is a chain of narrators. Who saw the Prophet pray that way? How was their memory? How was their moral character? Who did they tell it to? How many other people saw the same thing? Right? So it's a very specific, clear evidence for everything. Now, many Muslims may not know how to pray correctly because they didn't take the time to learn, but that's their bad. But if whoever wants to learn, we have scholars and we have books and we can explain every aspect of the prayer and how it should be done. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? Gotta, gotta keep going, this is wonderful. Hold on. I don't see your hand. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, Sheikh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Hadith Qudsi. Excellent. Not to bore our uh, non-Muslim visitors, I'll give a brief answer. Otherwise, we could teach a class on this, and I do teach a class on this. Right? My master's is in Hadith, so this is my thing. Um, the Hadith 
we check them in hadith being either the statements, actions, or approvals of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. We check them, verify them for authenticity in many ways. We look at who reported it, how was their memory, their dhab, how was their moral character, their adal, how was the connectivity of the chain, how many people reported it, tawatir and ahad and all of that. And one of the aspects of that is how far up from the author of the book of hadith does it go? Meaning, if a tabi'i makes a statement, or a sahabi, a companion makes a statement, or the prophet, peace be upon him, makes a statement, or the prophet reports it being from Allah, we give them their own uh, categories. Matu'a, marfu'a, and from the prophet Yani Qudsi, that he says that I have heard from Allah, or Allah told me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that is not the same as the Qur'an. The Qur'an is the words of Allah. Kalam Allah, ghair makhluq. It's not the words of the Prophet, peace be upon him. They are the words of Allah conveyed to us by the Prophet But Hadith Qudsi are the words of the Prophet conveying a meaning from Allah. Right? And this is again checked for authenticity. Not every Hadith Qudsi is authentic. Have Jarb al Ta'deel and looking at the Rawat and so on. But this is, uh, sorry to bore you guys, this is a good question though. All right, go ahead. Can you explain slavery in a sense? Excellent question. Slavery in Islam. If we look at the Western concept of slavery, what we had in the U United States uh, at a time where people that were free people that were regularly living their lives were kidnapped or taken brought by force and sold into slavery, Islam has never had it and has never approved it, ever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we, all of us, are slaves to Him, to our Creator. When Allah says to be born, we are born. When He says it's time for you to go, it's time for you to go. When Allah gives us food, He gives us food. When He tests us with hardship, He tests us. We are the slaves of Allah. We are not to be slaves of any human. And that's why Umar ibn Khattab in one of his famous sermons, he said, what's wrong with you people that you want to enslave the slaves of Allah to the slavery of, of people? When the Muslims went to Persia, one of the statements they made, they said, we're here to take people out of being slaves of people, to be only the slaves of their creator. So people are to be free. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in an authentic narration, he said that Allah will be a plaintiff against somebody who enslaves a free person. And Allah on the day of the day will tell them that these were my creation, my slaves. How dare you take somebody like that and enslave them? And in that aspect, Islam totally condemns slavery. What we do have in Islam is we have prisoners of war. Meaning if you do get into a war in the battles, what we had in the older, olden times is if you were victorious, you would massacre the people. The Arabs, what they would do before Islam, is if they were victorious, they would be killed, they would kill off people. As we see Amalek and what happened in the biblical text and so on as well, it would be just a massacre. You would go in, slaughter away. And Islam condemned that. Islam stopped that. If you are going to be in a war and somebody's going to try to kill you and fight you, you also can't be like, I just want, okay, you can go do whatever you want, they'll just attack you right away again. Right? So to take people as captives of war that will be under your authority because they tried to kill you and fight you. This is in Islam, we have this. Even then, there are rules and regulations. You cannot abuse them, you cannot mistreat them, you have to feed them, you have to take care, you don't put them in Gitmo and have dogs biting there. Anyway, um, we have rules and regulations, how to properly keep. And even then, Islam encourages that even when you have taken them as captives of war that were trying to fight you, if you see good uh, coming in them, then you free them, you let them go. And many of the great scholars of Islam, like Nafi' and Hamran, who were the Mawla, they were the free captives from war, were freed and became great scholars. So we have people who are going to be taken captives of war, who do not have slavery in the Western sense of what slavery is. And that would be only through war. Go ahead. Uh, according to Islam, uh if a Muslim or a non-Muslim commits something hideous or something that's unfortunate, uh, what are some of the ways that that individual can redeem themselves? Great question. If somebody uh, commits a horrendous crime, 
um, in Islam, we have the concept of tawbah, of repentance. You don't have to go to a shaykh and say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned, and, you know, say Hail Marys or anything like that. Rather, in Islam, you repent directly to your creator. Right? I'm talking about a Muslim first. Right? So, there are three conditions. A fourth, at certain times, I'll explain. One is, you should feel ashamed. You shouldn't be proud of it. Right? You shouldn't be, uh, you know, yeah, I killed somebody. Yeah, man, I killed somebody. What? I'm sorry about it. Wow. Yeah, I killed somebody. But, you know, you have to be ashamed of the sin. You cannot be proud about it. You cannot be feeling good about it. You have to have repentance. Secondly, you have to make tawbah. You have to turn to your creator, to Allah, to your Rabb, to your Lord, and ask for repentance. Say, Allah, I sinned. It was my mistake. I ask you for forgiveness. And, and with full conviction that Allah will forgive you. And Allah is the most forgiving. And the last, you have to make an intention not to go back to it. You don't want to be like, I just got drunk last night and drove a car and hit somebody. Oh, I'm so sorry, but yo, what time are we meeting at the bar tomorrow? No. You have to make an intent. You might fall into the sin again. Humans are weak, but you have to make an intent not to go back to it. So with those three, you repent directly between you and your creator. There is a fourth if you wronged somebody. Right? Let's say, uh, what's your name, brother? Ali. 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 Ali has a really nice colored kuf. Kulan <laughs> swaz. A hat. And I like his hat and I steal his hat. <laughs> Sorry. Right? And now, I feel bad about it. But then I keep it anyway. <laughs> I'm like, God, I'm really sorry I did this, but it's good. <laughs> no, in this situation, I need to right my wrong to the person. And if I don't, then Allah will judge between us on the day of judgment. I cannot just repent to Allah. Now I have to right my wrong. So when I wrong Ali, then I can go to him and either give him his hat back, or I can tell him, look, I'm sorry. Can I pay for a new hat? Can I, what can I do to make it up? That is when it is between people. These are the methods of forgiveness. If you're not Muslim, alhamdulillah, if you become Muslim, Allah forgives all your past sins anyway. Right, so. Question. Um, a lot of people say that Islam was spread by the sword. How can you kind of explain that? Make Islam look like a donut or sort of a bagel or something. You know? <laughs> um, when we talk about spread by the sword, um, we would say first and foremost, Islam begins in the heart. Islam begins uh, this one here. Sheikh Abu Abdullah, if you can make sure that they get a Quran from me as a okay. gift, I need, to, I need to keep my word. Okay, okay. They'll get it. Excellent. So, when we talk about Islam being spread, Islam begins in the heart. That's where Islam begins. And there is no way. I can change your heart with a sword or a gun or anything by force. If I put a sword to your neck and tell you become Muslim, you may say it, but if it's not in your heart, then you're not a Muslim. Secondly, if you look historically, under Islamic rule of Andalus in Spain, for example, or the Islamic rule in Palestine in the time of Salah al-Din Ayyubi and others, people that were not Muslims, that were Christians and Jews, were allowed to practice their religion. They were allowed to keep their places of worship. They were allowed, they were not forced, unlike the Spanish Inquisition, where I mean, when the Muslims were driven out, they, the people were killed. If you're not a particular type of Christianity, you were persecuted, you were killed, you were tortured. And that is something that Islam forbids. Islam has a whole system which is called the Ahlul Dhimma, right? How non-Muslims can live and use their own laws for their own family laws, for example, under an Islamic rule as well. So Islam cannot be spread by the sword and has not been spread by the sword in the sense that people say that Islam was forced upon people with the sword. When the Muslims of India ruled India for so many centuries, uh, Hindus still kept a majority. Right? They were not forced for any conversions. Uh, unlike what we see especially by the Catholic tradition in South America or in the Philippines or in many parts of the world when, when they would forcefully convert people. That is something Islam condemns. Everybody has to make the choice if they want to be Muslim or not. This is between them and Allah. Allah has the haq that he should be the only one worshipped. But he gives people the choice. 
If somebody decides to be an atheist, that's their choice. The, the, the punishment or the outcome or the answering to Allah on the Day of Judgment is there. But Allah did not force that. Allah, Allah could have made everybody Muslim. But He left this as a test, as a choice to be made. So even historically, we do not find where Muslims went and forced people to become Muslim at the tip of the sword. Go ahead. Uh, she's going to take the brother in the back, and then we'll come to the front. Uh, Sheikh, I'm wondering if uh, Prophet Muhammad was perfect or if he ever made mistakes. Excellent. Was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam perfect? It kind of depends on your definition of perfect. In the sense that all humans have certain shortcomings. Right? Perfection where there is no weakness, there is no tiredness, there is no uh, anything that can be taken as... Uh, for example, if a person gets tired working, are they perfect or not? Like you see, in that sense, only Allah has what we say, Subhana wa ta'ala. Allah has no weaknesses, no imperfections, nothing of, of uh, uh, that can be condemned or be uh, 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 something that could be uh, corrected. Even. Allah is perfect. His knowledge is perfect. He knows everything. Every decision of Allah is perfect. Uh, he's never not existed. He's always existed. He will always exist. He never does wrong. Uh, Allah is that one subhana, and you say subhana, free from all imperfections. Every human will have certain imperfections. You get tired, right? You get frustrated, sleep. you get you sleep, you get hungry, you go to the bathroom, you have qada uh, al and things like this. In that sense, every prophet is going to have those imperfections. Okay? But we believe he was a perfect role model. Right? Allah protected him from sins, things that would be considered sinful. Okay? So if we look at uh, the prophets, they are to be examples for mankind. Right? They are to be followed. They are not divine as if they are a part of Allah. No. They are humans. They will sleep, they will eat, they will, they will, things will anger them. But they never do an action that is intentionally sinful because that would then misguide people, right? For example, if we look at the story of Lot in the Bible and some of the things that have been attributed, we as Muslims do not believe Lot as a righteous servant would do what is there. Or David, for example, and what happened with the lady and all that, we do not believe. We believe David and, and Abraham and Moses, and these were examples for mankind. They were human. But they did not intentionally sin. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in his character, he was perfect. Okay? But again, not if you mean perfect in the sense that he never got tired, that he never uh, had to go to the bathroom or something like this. No. Questions? Go ahead. Sheikh Zari, could ask you that. How about if I believe God? believe God but also I believe God uh, Jesus as son of God and I died there. Hmm. Where I go? Good question. Um, as Muslims we believe that the belief in Allah in God is a belief that has to be in line with what God has said about himself. Okay? That if we take that God is multiple or has children or a father or uncle or roommate and things, this would violate the core belief of Islam. We do not believe that, right? This is to be kufr. Having said that, somebody could have such a belief and then change that belief. They can make tawbah, they can become Muslim, so that is there. So where somebody ends up depends on what they die upon. If somebody dies on kufr and shirk, then this is the people of Naam. And if somebody dies on Tawheed, the belief in the one God, the one Creator, then this is the people of Jannah. More questions? Go ahead. So I've asked um, people about like praying for people that have passed away already. Um, and I still have a lot of confusion around that. It seems like during prayer, 
we are saying peace and blessings be upon the Prophet Muhammad. Um, but, and then I've heard like people say that when their kids pray after they're gone, their reward will be greater while they're in the grave. So can you speak to that a little bit? Great question. Praying for somebody that has passed away. So I think the confusion gets to be is where we talk about what do we mean by praying for? English is interesting language, right? Um, if I pray for you in the sense that I say, what's your name brother? Kwesi. Kwesi? MashaAllah. If I say, oh Allah, give Kwesi uh, a good job. I'm praying for you, that I'm praying to Allah for something that benefits you. Nothing wrong with that. Even if somebody's passed away, if I say, oh Allah, have mercy on my father. Oh Allah, give my father a high rank in Jannah. Oh Allah, give my teachers and the scholars that I studied with that have passed away uh, the highest level of paradise. Nothing wrong with that. No Muslim scholar would condemn that. The confusion gets to be in the sense that, uh, Qaisi, are you Muslim? Yes. Alhamdulillah. So you pray Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, right? Yes, I'm a new Muslim. New Muslim, mashallah, but you're Muslim. So now the five prayers are obligatory on you. And if I say, oh Allah, I'm going to pray Dhuhr for Qaisi so he doesn't have to pray. <laughs> I'm praying for you, in place of you. That is not allowed. Right? So you see the confusion with the English language, right? Meaning that everybody has their own deeds that they are responsible for. But if you raise pious children, and they make dua, they supplicate for you, that is a benefit for you. The Prophet, peace be upon told us that the deeds of the children of Adam all end except three. One is sadaqa jariya, those things that continue to benefit. Let's say you open up a, a well in a place that they don't have water, and you are dead, people are still drinking that water, you will be getting that reward, even after your death. Ilm al the beneficial knowledge. You taught somebody Quran, they're reading that Quran, after you're dead, it's still benefiting you. Or, what of the salih, the pious child, the one that makes dua for them. So the children, you raise them well. My sons, keep, pay attention to this. When I'm dead, pray for me, right? So making dua for the parents. This is good. But it is not that they're praying my prayers for me. Right? Maybe I owe their debt. They can pay that debt on my behalf. Maybe I didn't perform Hajj. They can go perform a Hajj on my behalf because that was something that I should have done, that I did not do, that they, as my children, should be responsible for. But you cannot be like, I'm going to pray Dhuhr right now, but I'm also going to pray for my teachers and for my neighbor that passed away. No, that is not a part of Islam. As far as like having mercy on someone that has passed or something like that, is that the same whether they are Muslim, they die a Muslim or not? So, dua, supplication are different at different times. Maybe, uh, for example, if your parents are alive and you say, oh Allah, guide them. Right? Nothing wrong with that dua. But if they have passed away, then, then this worldly life is done. We believe that this life is where you have to make your choices. Once you pass away, so think of it this way, right? Um, how many of you have taken an exam in a, the examination hall? Raise your hand or a test. I'm just doing this to make sure you guys are all awake. Because <laughs> I know you've all taken a test sometime or not, right? So you go, to, you go to a test, I mean, nowadays you don't have examination hall, let's say it's online and they have a timer and it starts. That's this life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You created death and life, the whole system, to see which one of you puts forth the best of deeds. So that's this life. Once that buzzer goes off, once your timer is up, once the examination hall says it ends down, that's it. This is done. So if your parent dies in Islam, then you make dua for them, pass their examination hall. If they did not, then that's it. They have passed their, they have passed the timeline where they should have. Then that's it. Past that, we leave the case with Allah. And sometimes you don't know somebody was Muslim or not. Allah Alam, but we judge by the appearance. More questions? Go ahead. So life after death, do you yes. believe in that? And we do. What happens to the person? That... Excellent question. Life after death. We as Muslims believe that uh, uh, that this life is a temporary abode, a, a stage in the greater scheme of things. We believe that before we were in this life, we were in what's called Alam al-Arwah, the place of souls. 
when you were souls, but you did not have physical bodies as we do here. And people met each other in those times. And that's why sometimes you meet somebody immediately like, you have that connection with them. Sometimes you meet somebody like, I'm good. Right? Um, so that was an earlier life. Okay? Then we have the life of the womb of the mother. Nine months about, we have a very different life. In that life, we don't sit around and talk to each other and drink tea and talk or drink water or any of this. It's a very different existence. You're fed through a tube, you have liquid going into your lungs, all of that. That's one stage now. When that stage is over, you finish that stage and you come into the world. Totally different rules. Now you're breathing oxygen, air, uh, yeah, now you're talking to people, you're eating with your teeth and mouth and very different existence in a different time frame. However long your life may be, 70, 100 years, you, you will now live in this world. When that life is done, you will go into the barzakh. This is the next stage. This is the grave. Now that's a very different existence. You will not be going around and meeting people and eating the way you do in this world. But you will be alive in the barzakh life, in that stage. And you have questioning in the grave. Well, how you lived and what you did. Then you are raised on the day of judgment. We believe there is a day of judgment. Yom al where you will be raised from the graves, not like zombies coming out. You will be recreated from the bottom tip that's left, from that, you know, like today we could say, from the DNA on there, like in a worldly example, how a person is cloned. The Prophet told us that all of your body will deteriorate except a little bit, and then Allah will recreate you on the day of judgment. You will stand again. And that's a different life. That's a life that no longer ends. It's an endless life. Your mindset, your, like in this world, you know how you get sick of stuff. Even if you have the best ice cream after a while, you're like, I'm sick of it, man. What's your favorite ice cream? Strawberry. Strawberry? Yeah. If I lock you in that library and feed you nothing but strawberry ice cream, after a while, you're going to be like, please, not strawberry ice cream, right? Because this world wasn't meant forever. To even something you love, you start to get sick of it. I'm not going to give spousal examples so that I don't get myself in trouble. Um, so, the hereafter, that life is forever. In the, in the paradise, for example, the Prophet told us that every time you taste the fruit, it will taste different and better. Every time you see your spouse, you'll be more handsome and, and more beautiful. Handsome for the man and beautiful for the woman. You will have the spouse you have in this world, Zaytan and Islam, you will be spouses in the paradise. It's not till death do you apart in Islam. Even after death, you're united. So when somebody dies, then on the day of judgment, you will have judgment. Right? People, if a rapist, murderer, then never got caught in this world, it doesn't mean he got away with it. The righteous judgment of God will be there on the day of judgment. And then those that will be punished will be punished in the hellfire. Those that will go to heaven will go to heaven. We don't think of it like the Hollywood version of hell where, you know, the devil is sitting and ruling the place. Nah, we don't believe that. This is a place that is there for punishment that we couldn't even imagine the punishment. That bad. May Allah protect us all from it. And paradise is not like you're going to be playing a harp on a cloud. Like, I don't even like harps. Like, how would I want to do that? Rather, you will enjoy in paradise whatever you will for. A never-ending life, no sicknesses. This is the real life. This is what we were destined for. Where you will be seeing your Lord. You will see God. You will see each other. You will have your own paradise. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told us it is so beautiful. That no mind can imagine. No eye has seen. No ear has heard. So everything we see in the Quran or in the authentic narrations, these are examples about rivers and trees and a beautiful place to give you an example to understand, but it will be more beautiful than anything you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And that is the hereafter. But they, so when you die though, mm -hmm. where does your body, where do you go? Exactly. I mean, you're, you're saying that you wait till a day of judgment and you rise sure. again, but yeah. in the meantime, where are you? Great question. So that is the barzakh life. We call it barzakh. Barzakh is the life of the grave. In the grave, you are you have a physical body that will deteriorate, except for prophets and uh, martyrs and stuff. But then your physical body starts to deteriorate. But your soul is there as well. It is connected. And it is where you wait, right? Until the day of judgment. Now, for the believer, for the pious person, this time will feel very short like between two prayers. And for the evil person who massacred, murdered, did whatever wrong, he will have punishment in the grave as well. And there will not be a fun time for them as well. 
So this is why we believe this life is a very important time for us to recognize our Creator and to worship our Creator because what comes next is a lot longer. Never ending is a long time. Allah protect us. Great question. Go ahead. Um, so, so for like the judgment, what can I say? So like if someone dies Muslim but is like sinful yes. and like doesn't repent for that, are they getting tossed like into the hellfire? Or? Great question. If somebody as a Muslim dies and they do not repent from their sins, what happened to them on the day of judgment? We as Muslims do not believe that somebody else will take our sin. We do not believe that you know, we'll kill somebody else and they die for our sins. We believe everybody is responsible for their actions. But there are ways of getting forgiveness, right? Like, you, like from your question I can deduce that one of the things we understand is in the world you can repent. Right? Let's say maybe I didn't uh, yeah, treat my neighbor good enough, whatever, something light, and I don't want to put myself <laughs> Right? Um, and then, you know, before I die, I'm saying, I'm really sorry, I used to throw trash over to your side, you know, my bad, and I, I kind of fixed that, so you're done. Maybe I was lazy with my prayers, but Allah not make it, but let's say, then, you know, you can repent for that in this world. Like, if you didn't repent, and you have some sins on you, maybe the hardship of death, or the hardships of life that you went through, like sicknesses, those things expiate the sins. The Prophet, peace be upon us, told us that the believer does not go through any hardship except that it expiates their sins, right? So maybe you got cancer, maybe you got COVID, and you're like, why me? Like, you know, not you, but some people are like, God, why me? Sometimes it's good for you. You may not realize it, but it purifies you from your sins. So you may not have repented, but Allah forgave you anyway because of those hardships. Maybe somebody prayed for you, like, Abu Abdullah made du'a for me, right? Right? And he says, oh Allah, forgive this brother Rahman. Maybe from his dua, Allah forgives me. Right? So there are many ways of getting those sins forgiven. Then, on the Day of Judgment, you have the hardships of the Day of Judgment. And Allah is so merciful. You could come with sins like the ocean and He can bring you more forgiveness and just forgive you. Without having to kill anybody or without having to uh, throw any wrath on anybody. Just Allah says, you're my good person. I know you sin, but you didn't... Uh, I mean, you, you weren't a bad person altogether. You didn't make shirk and so, so I forgive you. That's that as well. If your sin was against people, let's say, uh, what's your name? Aaron. Aaron. I'm just going to give a funny example. Go get that. Let's say you have a really nice car. And I'm like, I want that S class, right? And I walk up to you, put a gun to your head, and take your car. Not in Utah, but maybe in Cali, right? <laughs> now, you guys are so nice here, inshallah. Now, on the Day of Judgment, I owe you, right? Let's say both of us are Muslim and I, I, I did this wrong sin to you, I owe you. So on the Day of Judgment, Allah can take my good deeds, whatever good deeds I have, and give them to you to square us off. And if I don't have good deeds, Allah can put your bad deeds on me. But Allah makes justice between people. Or you could forgive me, you could be like, you know what, you can keep this class, I got the Bentley. <laughs> MashaAllah, Aaron, you do good, <laughs> right? But here you have sins between the makhluk, which will be dealt with on the Day of Judgment. Even the Prophet told us that if a horned ram hurt the one without horns, meaning it's unjust, Allah will make justice between them. So here when the justice is done, now past that, maybe as a Muslim, I did such horrible sins that even with all these cleansing and I didn't repent and I didn't do this, then it could be that I would enter the hellfire. But if you have the correct belief, sooner or later you will come out. Right? But we do believe in responsibility. We ask Allah for mercy. Right? We don't ask Allah to take us account because all of us have shortcomings. We ask Allah to have mercy on us. And we know that Allah is so merciful, our Creator, that no matter how many sins we have done, there's a beautiful hadith that I'll end with, where a man killed 99 people. That's pretty, that's gangster, right? 99 people. And he went to a person who was a worshiper, somebody, and this is before the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This is pre uh, the time of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu And he said, can I ever be forgiven? And the worshiper, who was very dedicated to worship, he thought, man, killing one person is like killing all of mankind. How can <laughs> 99 people, that's a lot. He's like, I don't think he can be forgiven, right? So he killed them, made it 100. <laughs> and then he went to a knowledgeable person, a person of knowledge. The person of knowledge, he told him, I killed a hundred people, could I be forgiven? He said, yes, you can be forgiven. But you have to right the wrongs, you have to leave your environment, you have to do what's right. So 
So this person who's set to leave the bad environment, to go to the place of the pious, and he dies on the way. Right? And here Allah forgives him because he had repented, he had tried, even though he such sins. So Allah can forgive all sins as long as we repent. Good? Clear? Got it. Allah? He's going to do the call to prayer. So this is what you heard. This is the call to prayer. And this is something again that we did not just come up with ourselves. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. He taught us this wording exactly the way he did it. Even you may have noticed that he turned his head to the right and left at certain statements. Even that was shown to us by the companions and the Prophet, peace be upon him, the approval to show how it's done. And this calls us to know that it's time for prayer. In the Muslim uh, majority countries and places, you will hear this throughout the city. It's a beautiful uh, reminder to us all that it is one, that it's a time for the prayer. And second, also to know that we are obligated by certain rules and regulations. It reminds you throughout the day. Um, the statement that he said is Allahu Akbar and he repeated that four times. This is to say that God is the greatest. It's not like a, not trying to kill anybody when you say it. You know? <laughs> Allahu Akbar, Allah is going to kill us. Like, ah, take it easy. Right? Um, and he, like you would say hallelujah or somebody would say uh, praise God or something like this. In the same way, we say God is the greatest. Allah, the only one worthy of worship. Akbar. The greatest, nothing is greater than God. There is no need that you have that is more important. You got to remember your priorities, right? Then we say our testimony of faith. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I bear witness there is none worthy of worship except Allah, twice. And you bear witness that Muhammad is the, is the messenger of Allah, twice we say. Then he turns to the right and he says, Hayya al salah, come towards the prayer. Come to pray, there's a time for praying. And then he turns to the left and he says, Hayyan al falah, come towards success. That success is not just in the worldly means and just trying to make money and trying to do by any means, but rather in, in, in serving our Creator and worshiping, this is success. And then he repeats that Allah is the greatest and he ends by the testimony of the belief in the oneness of Allah again. This is the call to prayer. And alhamdulillah, Throughout the Muslim world, you can go, you will hear the same thing. If you go to Malaysia, if you go to Indonesia, you go to uh, any of these countries, even in countries where Muslims may not be the majority, but you see a large Muslim population, you will see, you will hear this call to prayer, reminding Muslims for their responsibilities in front of God and also the prayer. All right, go ahead. Question. Yes, so we do it here inside the mosque because. Uh, here we cannot do it outside, so it kind of just helps us remind that it's time for prayer here. We fulfill that obligation. In uh, countries where you would have a larger Muslim population, you would do it outside, so it can reach people. Like you know, you're at the store, you're buying and selling, and then you hear it. Like if you visit, for example, the UAE or something, even in a mall, you hear it. So then people know it's time for prayer, and they'll go pray. So is that a calling? Does the same person do that every day? So it could be the same person, it could be different people. Here we have Sheikh Ahmed who is visiting us from Egypt, so he just did it. But if he wasn't here, there's other brothers that would do it. Uh, most mosques will have somebody assigned for it. They're called the Muazzin, the one who gives the Adhan. But uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be. Some mosques will have more than one assigned so that if somebody's not here, uh, they're backed up. And all of this we do uh, not for a salary. We do this for the sake of our Creator, just to get the reward from our God. Um, even, mashallah, Shaykh Muhammad, he's not paid by the mosque, he works a regular job. But he does all of this, community building and leading and teaching, just for the reward from his Creator. In Islam, we don't have a priest class. We don't have this idea of, okay, now you're just going to sit and make money off the religion. Rather, we spend our own money in trying to help and propagate and move, uh, help people in need and so on. We have scholars, no doubt, who study their life, they spend their life studying and leading and you know, 
providing social services for the community and all of that. But we don't have a priest class. Sometimes a scholar could be a businessman or be a worker at a restaurant or whatever. But he has the knowledge, he's a scholar. All right. Go ahead. Um, I just have like kind of related to my last question I thought. Oh, come on. Why last? Keep going. <laughs> You're doing good. Um, so like, so for someone, I'm, from what I understand, do like, you guys believe that like drinking alcohol is safe, right? Yes. Um, so if someone like say can't stop drinking alcohol and they just, they like drinking it, but they're, they're kind of thinking, well, when I die with the judgment day, Allah will just like forgive my sins and they're so they're all right, I don't need to stop. Thinking of the is that like? Great question. I don't know if that makes sense. Right? I, it does make sense. Um, and it's a great question. Um, if somebody, let's say, is not Muslim and they love drinking and they feel like if I become Muslim, it would be hard for me to give up alcohol, so then I would still be drinking and that's sinful. So, first thing, just to understand, why is alcohol forbidden in Islam? It is not because if we drink alcohol, it would hurt God. Or it would, I mean, you know, look up in the sky and look at the universe. In Islam, we believe that this, everything that has stars, that has what we call masabih, the, the lights that you see in the night, this is just the first sky, sama al dunya. In Surah Mulk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Zayyina sama al dunya, the masabih. We beautify the first sky with these lamps. Above that is the second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh sky that we can't even imagine. Past our telescopes and our imagination, darkness, past this lit up uh, universe that we have, and all of that belongs to that one God. Billions of galaxies and planets, things that we don't even know. So, me and you getting drunk doesn't hurt God anymore. Who does it hurt? It hurts us. We know, and I, I work in the med device industry, so there's clinically reviewed research that has recently been published, which was on Fox, surprisingly. That says even mild drinking, social drinking, light amounts of alcohol has clearly been linked to cancer. Right? People used to say, oh, a little bit of drinking is good for you. No. And look at the peer review, clinical trials, journal entries that show that it is bad for you. If you look at the effect of alcohol on your liver, on your heart, on your body, on your brain, on decision making, no drunk thinks they are drunk. You know? If you go to a drunk and he's doing like this, you're like, hey, give me your key. Like, no, I got it, man, I'm good. You know, every alcoholic's like, I could quit any time. You lost your job, you lost your family, I think it might be a good time to quit, bro. Right? No, I'm good. So that tells you that alcohol, even if it does have some benefits, but the evils of it outweigh. So Allah made alcohol haram, forbidden on us for our own benefit. See? If somebody's a Muslim and they drink, we don't say that they're not Muslim anymore. We don't take them out of the religion. We say it's sinful, but they're still Muslim. Allah can still forgive them. So if somebody is not Muslim and they feel like they cannot give up drinking and how could I be a Muslim and drink, we would say you should try, but don't hold, let you hold that back from recognizing your Creator, worshiping that one God. That is the most essential of it. Even if you were drinking alcohol, Allah can forgive you on the day of judgment, right? So that's between you and Allah. But as a Muslim, we would tell every Muslim, why would you want to do that? Sometimes something may feel good, you may enjoy it, but you know it's harming you. So in that sense, you have to stop yourself, or at least try, right? Uh, I mean, I'll give you a more extreme example, just to understand. If you have a family member, may Allah protect uh, all your family members of and and all that. And let's say they want to do heroin. What would you tell them? Don't do it. <laughs> Heroin's a death sentence, and you start shooting those needles, it's not something you're going to be, right? And they might be like, I feel great doing it. And you can tell them, like, you may feel great, but it's killing you. It will destroy your life. And I tell you, more people have died because of alcohol than heroin. Statistically, right? Every year, the drug driving accidents, the, we're not even counting people who died because of health effects, just from the drug driving of it. We as a society know the, the harms of alcohol, but unfortunately, due to certain lobbies and certain interests, nobody wants to talk about it. Right? How many families have been destroyed because of alcohol? How many children have been abused because of alcohol? How many spousal abuse cases have come forward because of alcohol? How many people 
have made, and I think almost everybody that went to college, not on a religious uh, trend, would say they made bad decisions while being drunk, right? So that is why Allah forbid that for us, knowing is better for us. Allah forbid us from premarital marital spousal relations because Allah knows that's better for us. So if we violate these rules, we can still repent. Allah can still forgive us. We're not saying if you drink alcohol, khalas, you're going to go to hell for no matter what. No. But as a Muslim, we always want to live life in the way that Allah is ordained for us. Good? Go ahead. Go ahead. Beautiful question. Um, sister here said that she's always been treated very gracefully, gracefully, graciously by her Muslim friends. But the question is, are women given uh, equal rights and the proper respect and honor that a woman deserves uh, amongst the Muslim community gender? Question, right? So first thing I would say that feel free to go and talk to our sisters in Islam and ask them. When we look at Muslim women in America, Nobody's forcing them to cover, nobody's forcing them to be Muslim. It's a free country, they can make any choice they want. But the fact that you see them in the mosque, that you see them practicing their religion, you see them covering, you see them praying, shows that this is something that they choose. And in Islam, we believe in giving everybody their rights. And everybody has rights. And everybody has the divine rights that Allah has given them. Meaning it's not just my opinion and your opinion, it is divine. In Islam, the one that has the most rights upon you is a woman, is your mother. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was asked, who has the most rights on you? He said, your mother. He said, what about after that? He said, your mother. He said, what about after that? He said, your mother. He said, what about after that? He said, then your father. I mean, look at the honor a woman is given in Islam. In Islam, those are my sisters. Those are not pray for me to pray upon. Rather, for me to pray for them, different pray, right? So this is an honor. When we don't have mixing and things, this is so that everybody focuses on their prayer. Everybody focuses on the religious obligation. It's not a better or worse situation. For example, and again, I'm going to be very honest. I believe in honesty and I believe in openness and I don't believe in hypocrisy. Okay? Biologically and psychologically in many other ways, there is a time where men want to show off for women. It's just a part of the way the human race, even in animals, you see it, they'll different dances they'll do or puff up their chest or whatever. They want to attract a mate. And women will do similar things to attract a mate, even if they don't admit it, you know. Um, they will, I'm, I'm honest, I'm sorry, right? So this is a part of the human experience. Nothing wrong with it. But we want to make sure it's in the right place, in the right way, right? The mosque is not a place for me to be like, ah, I'm about to start praying, guys. Ah, oh, so sore from working out. No. <laughs> you don't want to do that. I used to go to church when I was younger. I'm going to be very honest. And it was, uh, I mean, I went to very different types of church. But one of them was a Christian church. Um, and basically, a lot of the young people there were trying to find connections. That's what, that was really what we were doing, to be honest. Yes, there was Bible studies. I was the only one that paid attention, very honestly. Yeah. All my friends that were Christians were not paying attention. I was like, hey, I got this question. They were like, shh, just trying to meet a girl here, but I got to ruin it for me. <laughs> and they would, you know, they would say things and do things to attract the office gender. And a lot of the focus really was, even if they didn't admit it, like, a lot of girls would really dress up really well for church, and it wasn't because they wanted to show off to God, to be very honest. A lot of men would dress up in certain ways because they had that. For us, we want to keep this as a place of prayer, of solitude, of meditation, of a connection with our Creator. 
right? So we keep things in a way that separate so that women are not worried about oh, what guy is looking at me and how am I dressed and men are not worried about, you know, how am I going to flex it. And a lot of that sometimes is subconscious. You know? If you, I studied, my minor was in psychology, right? Sometimes if you just do a social experiment, right? you look at a guy who's just going to get up and go to the gym where there's only men right? or, or only women gym, which and then you look at how they dress when they go to a co-mixed gym. Psychologically, you'll see a difference. And a lot of times we won't admit it. We're like, no, I just, I just, you know, do this. I want to look good for myself. Well, when you wake up at, in the morning and it's a day off and you're just sitting around watching Saturday cartoons, you're not dressed up, right? But if you go to the beach, I better get my spray tan and this and that. Why? Because we have that. Places of worship should be free from that. You shouldn't worry about as a woman. How are men going to look at me? Or is he, when I'm bowing and prostrating, is somebody looking at my body? A woman should be able to worship her creator with that freedom. And a man should not be in a mosque worried about if, how is he going to find a spouse or a thing. He should be worried about his creator. So we have this separation. It is not better or worse. It is not I mean, that somebody is closer to God. The Prophet, peace be upon told us, that there is no difference between white and black and red and, 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 and anything except whoever is, is more pious. That is what grants us closest to God. Men are not better than women in their closest to God. Women are not better than men in their closest. It depends on their piety. There can be a woman that is much more pious than any of us sitting here. That could be much more knowledgeable than us sitting here. right? Or there could be a man who is more knowledgeable. That is all your relationship with your Creator. When we talk about rights, um, I believe that Islam gives women rights that Western society doesn't. Um, I'll give you examples. When we look at a right to not be judged based on appearances, no law is going to talk about but I was in management, and I can tell you from experience. And you can do social, there is a Netflix documentary, it's, I think it's called 100 something, 100 people, 100 humans or something. And they do these social experiments. And they did experiments with women that were makeup up, dressed in a certain way, and others that were not. And people would judge them based on their looks. They did an experiment where they had a group of people unbeknownst to them that were told about a crime committed by somebody. And they showed two different people, to two different controlled groups, one of them being in what we would consider to be an attractive outfit and dressing, and the other to not. And they said, how long would you give the prison? We gave different times. They give the person who wasn't as, quote unquote, uh, socially considered to be dressed well and attractive, longer times for the same crime. When you go to job interviews, people tell a woman, you have to dress this way, even if they don't do it verbally. And this is the hypocrisy of, of, of the Western society, that we do things, the Me Too movement has exposed a lot of that. People were told, no, you have the right to go and, and, and be in movies and things, but they didn't show them that the, the, the place where they would be harmed and would be judged and then abused by such uh, people like uh, Weinstein and others. In Islam, we believe that that shouldn't be the case. A woman that comes and she's honorable and she's covered in a modest way and then she speaks to you and then she interviews for a job, you can't judge her on how good she, good she looks in a pinstripe skirt anymore. You have to now judge her on her ability, on her piety, on her uh, brain and her what she brings forth from her personality. And that's a right I, I, I think has been taken away even if not verbally. Like we in society don't say that a secretary should be uh, attractive. But do a social experiment. Go to the top CEOs of America and find their personal assistants and, and just look at it. Okay? Be honest. Well, why do we have to have this hypocrisy? Um, nowadays we have this push towards uh, different body shapes amongst models and things. But again, it's a very surface push. In reality, we still have an idea of beauty that is pushed down on people. And in Islam, we don't have that. We, we don't say taller or lighter skinned or this. Or, you know. The beauty is from the inside. 
This is when a Muslim woman here, for example, if she asks me a question, I don't know what she looks like. I, I'm not judging her on her looks. I'm not judging her on how well she can do her makeup or you know what size uh, clothes she fits into. I have to listen to the question and respond to it just based on her intellect, on her mind. And that's the respect I have to give her. What we see in many churches and many other places are is the abuse of women that is swept under the table. And I mean, I'm not talking about any particular church here, but I do know in San Diego, for example, many of the churches that I went to, pastors ended up having affairs with people in the congregation and things. And, and this is not something that happens just like you walk in and suddenly you're like, let's have an affair. No, there, it, it, there is a progression towards it. You start looking at certain things, you start having private conversations, you start having, and that progresses into something. Islam believes in prevention, right? We don't want to go there. If a woman has a question, she can ask her question, I can give responses, I can give her scholarly advice. Why do I need to go out and, and have dinner with her privately to do that? I don't. So we keep that as a safeguard for us. Good? Clear? Go ahead. So what about... Facial hair. Can you tell me about that? It seems to it be looks good, doesn't it? There's controversy <laughs> on uh, some Muslim societies trim their beard, some don't. Sure. The facial hair. Um, can I can I just say one thing? Go for it. Is it okay, inshallah, to add it to make that the last question, inshallah? Oh, I'm having so much fun. Well, uh, <laughs> Uh, with the permission of you, inshallah, I, I would like Imam uh, Ahmed, inshallah ta'ala, since you are offering a free Quran for everybody, inshallah ta'ala, uh, he's going to be reciting uh, surah, some, some part of Surah Maryam, it's chapter number 19. And then uh, after you recite it, I would like you, as a request from me then, to go and read that chapter, chapter number 19, that which he recited, if that's okay with you, inshallah ta'ala, okay? And uh, anyway, we, we could do that, we could pray, and then, and then we could, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, come back again, add it, but you know, just for the, if that's Excellent. okay with you. Great. I'm at your service. I came from San Diego just for your sake, so any questions you have, anything, I'm here. Right? There's nothing taboo, you can ask away. That's the easy one, the facial hair. It looks good. <laughs> it's the mane for the lion. Um, if we look at um, depictions historically of Moses or Abraham or Jesus, peace and blessings be upon them, uh, all of them had beards. Right? Historic writings, academic writings would show that they were people with beards. Um, and this is the natural state of a man. But we do not say that this is an obligation in the sense of how the belief system or the daily prayer, right? It is in command from the Prophet, peace be upon him. And as Muslims, we try to fulfill those wujubat, those things which is wajib. But this is not a core belief issue. If you, you can be a Muslim and not have a beard. Um, you can be a Muslim and not wear hijab, even though we say it's fard to wear hijab, but the core belief of Islam, the aqidah, the belief, this is the core that makes or breaks your Islam. But past that, then there are us in our want to follow the way of the prophets, the earlier, those that were given the scriptures, those that Allah, uh, as the God, the creator, uh, revealed to them. And all of them have a similar look. Right? They will have beards, they will have uh, uh, loose, modest clothing, even for men. Uh, so this is why you see Muslim men from the following of the example of the prophets. From what the Prophet Muhammad him, ordered us to do, we trim the mustaches and grow the beards. But like I said, this shouldn't be something that holds somebody back from Islam. Like if you don't want to grow a beard, at least you should accept Islam. And then you can work on those things later. Um, the last thing for that I will say is, if you see somebody with a mohawk, not so common nowadays, but if you did, and earrings and nose rings and, and he says Metallica and he has a guitar and he has ripped jeans and you know and he's like Duh, right I'm gonna just, you will ascribe him to certain things right 
you would assume he likes that type of music and that's the kind of mindset that he has. That's just the way it is. You are, you are representing something of a belief set. If you see somebody, and this is not a political uh, point, this is a psychological point, with uh, Make America Great Again red hat, and you see him Trump 2024 and lock her up or whatever else, um, or you see somebody with a Biden cap and a, you know Clinton should be president, whatever. I don't really care, but either way, that representation will tie them to something, right? So we as Muslims believe that in the way that our facial features represent, or in the way we dress, or in the way that we carry ourselves, should tie us to those prophets, the pious people. It should not be something representing um, things that are sinful or things that are useless. Rather, to use that as a means of communication. For example, if you see me walking down the street in San Diego and you have a question about Islam, most likely you will recognize me to be Muslim and you'll be able to engage with me. That's a way of me to open up communication with you. But you know, if I try to hide the identity, whatever, then, then that communication goes away, right? But if you I don't want to keep a beard, that is not something that should stop you from the core belief of Islam. Those things all come later on. So I was just wondering, so I had an Uber driver that was, I noticed he was reading the Quran. And I was just wondering, like, I didn't know if I, if I asked him if he'd be like, offended, like, are you Muslim or something like that? I didn't know if that was like a... It's a political thing. Actually, we are proud. So when you see somebody reading the Quran, you should feel free to ask them whether they're Muslim. Nobody should be offended by that. Okay. If they're not Muslim, I'm sorry. So if they're not Muslim, they can say I'm not Muslim. Mm -hmm. If they are Muslim, they should be uh, more than happy to share with you that they're Muslim and what they're reading and why they're Muslim. Some people might get offended, it's up to them, but you should not feel shy to ask that question. Okay. Cool. Yes, when my, my brother's Muslim, I was like, oh, that's cool. I didn't know if I was, that was okay. Your brother's Muslim, and you're doing it. Yeah, relax. <laughs> you're gonna be what, what, what about you? What do you believe? What's that? What do you believe? Um, I'm LES. Okay. You do believe one creator? Yeah. That's good. All right. So we would share that belief together, right? Yeah. We do believe that creator sent uh, no. messages to prophets, right? Yeah. Whether we last prophet or not, we'll discuss that later. But you do have the same belief, right? Yeah. Right? So regarding the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament, I think that'll be a church as well, well researched about some of the changes and corruptions that happened, right? Yeah. So, for example, King James and his slave in the Bible and stuff, you would agree that's wrong, right? It's true, yeah. I right? <laughs> so, I'll make sure I'll say yeah. that, right? So, now, the difference, without going into the later prophets or Joseph Smith or any of that, from Jesus to Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon both of them, the only difference would be is whether the prophet Muhammad was an actual prophet or not. Right? Sure, yeah. yeah so. Let's say we would agree that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, according to the consensus of the story, was not literate. He couldn't read or write. Mm -hmm. You know, right? I'm sure you've heard that. Yeah. So how does a man who's unable to read or write bring forth a book that the best poets and the Arabic language experts, Shu'ara, at that time could not respond to? Think about it, right? Like, uh, do you speak Chinese? No. I'm assuming you don't, right? <laughs> now, if you, never know. If, you, if you came to me and you had a writing in a book in a language that you could not read or write, right? Uh, that was so eloquent that the best professors of the Chinese language couldn't respond. They were like, we cannot write anything like this. Wouldn't that be miraculous? Yes, sir. Yeah. Right? The Quran tells us that the heavenly bodies, the different planets, the moon, the sun, are in an orbit. They are in their own set course. Now imagine a man more than 14 centuries ago in a desert, in a in environment that was not conducive to scientific research, meaning without the Romans or the Greek or they were philosophers, the Arabs were poets, they were good at poetry, but that was about it. They, were, they didn't have a king, they were just attacking each other, Bedouin style, lifestyle. How would he know that? 
Right? Makes sense. No, maybe he gets it. Let's play, as they say, devil's advocate, right? Okay. The Quran talks about salt water and sea water touching but not mixing. Now we know the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, never went to an area where there was salt water. Everything around him was sea was so sweet water. So how would he know that? Maybe he guessed the second time he got it right. The Quran talks about how there are waves under the ocean. He never went scuba diving. How could he have known that? Maybe he guessed again and got it right. The Quran talks about the development of the fetus in the womb of the mother. Some things that were not known until ultrasound technology came forward. How would you know that? Hey, if you put all of that together, don't you think that it does show that there was a divine origin for the Quran? Yeah, it makes sense. You're almost almost there. You're there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of interesting. Like, I just I just like to see like the comparisons of like my religion and your religion with like with like Joseph Smith, like how we believe, and it's just kind of. It's kind of interesting to me, like the similarities there, like because he was Joseph Smith was only to like elementary age of like education. of education, yeah. And um, and so like when he's writing like like we have the Doctrine and Covenants for Scripture, and when he's writing the Doctrine and Covenants, it's like such uh, what's the word I'm looking for like eloquent, eloquent like writing and stuff. It's, it's I don't know. It's kind of cool like to compare. And that's, it is. That's, that's it is. So cool. Um, and and there's a lot of other. Uh, I think we have things in common as mm-hmm. Muslims and Mormons and so on, yeah. including a lot of moral beliefs and so on. Mm-hmm. And like I said, my name is a Mormon, so we have mm-hmm. discussions all the time. Yeah, that's cool. But let's take it to just on the Prophet Muhammad first of all, right? Peace and blessings be upon him. So, how does a man like that bring forth a message like that? And with no elementary education, and not just the eloquence of writing, but scientific things that could not have been known to him. Um, prophecies about who would win battles between Romans and Persians, and your brother can share a lot more details later. On top of that, today, let's say uh, I tell you that there was a gentleman named George Washington. You've heard of him? Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and George Washington led a revolt against the British to you know, make a country mm-hmm. called America. And he gave a particular speech. Some address, right? Gettysburg, Gettysburg was George Washington? No. That was Lincoln, sorry. Uh, what was George Washington? He gave some kind of address, huh? There you go, whatever that was. Um, would you believe that? Yeah. Okay, because you find it in history books and things about it. Do you know anybody that was physically present at that time when he gave a talk? Personally, no. Personally, no. Do you know the names of anybody that was first hand? Saw George Washington give a talk or her. I don't. Assuming yeah, that. You don't know know right? Records of it. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Yeah. Excellent. But but how do we know those records are correct? Right. Who checks those records? Right. Meaning, yeah. who are the ones that wrote it down or heard it? And obviously, between them and the history books that we read, there's a large gap of time. But because of those historic, unverified reports, we believe that did happen. Right. Mm-hmm. Christopher Columbus and him coming to the U.S. or uh, any, uh, Alexander, the so-called great, and the places that he conquered. We don't really know who were the first-hand reporters and who they told and stuff. But because of amazing things that we heard that they did and conquered and Marco Polo and all the places that he went. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, right? In his time, he asked them, why would not believe? They said, show us a miracle. So now what do you want? They said, split the moon. Right? And he prayed to Allah, to the creator, and the moon split. Now, while I'm saying this, you're like, whoa, easy there, guys. It's a pretty <laughs> incredible claim. But I, I, I got you. The moon split. And while they were watching, not like a meteorite hitting, the moon split. They, they said, between the mountain, you saw the two halves. And at the same time, it came back together. Mm-hmm. Can an average person do that? I agree. I mean, you uh, tonight, you want to go and be like, split the moves. It's not happening, right? Now, the question there that should come to your mind is how do we know that really happened, right? I mean, just because it's in a history book, I mean, we've got a whole section of history in the library, it's there, just like we believe in George Washington and uh, Alexander the Great. We don't, Muslims, we don't do that. We say, no, we want to verify. 
who saw it? People like Abdullah ibn Abbas, I just named, like I can tell you the first hand, Mut'im, others that were from the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that said, we saw this. Now, as a skeptical, uh, skeptical mind should, you could say, well, those are his people. Maybe they just made it up to try to make him look like he was doing something good, right? We can't know, they might have a bias. Okay. Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahl, Abu Mughira, these at the time were staunch enemies. Some of them, like Mut'im, who was not Muslim at the time, that became Muslim later. So at that time, they were staunch enemies, and they said we saw it. Right? And we can verify that. Who, who were the ones that heard from them? And who did they tell it to? Who did they tell it to? And we can tell you about each narrator's moral conduct and their memory. Right? So now that gives more credit that when your enemies, those that are against you, say, but some of them became Muslims, so you say, okay, maybe because they became Muslim, they kind of fabricated something. Many of them never became Muslim. They stayed staunch enemies. But they admitted that this did take place. Now, we can say, maybe he did some magic on it. Maybe he did a little trick, and you know, like how they try to make saints disappear and all that, right? Okay. Anas ibn Malik, one of the people that reports this hadith, at this time, he was in Medina. He was in a different city. So now, how do you, not just in Mecca, but in a city far away, they also saw it. People that were out for trade, and there's a book, it's here, it's called Bidai wa Nihai, Shaykh knows it, you can look at it, historic writings. Those tribes of the Arab that were traders, that were out of Mecca, they saw it, different geographical locations, and when they came back and they were questioned, they said we saw it. Then when they were outside of Mecca, they also saw it. Now, some of these are people that were idol worshippers. So now we get to saying, how could it be that these different people, foes and friends, in different locations saw the same thing? You could say, okay, well, how come nobody from any other Jirga other than the Arabian Peninsula? Why did nobody else see it? Well, I mean, of course, in America, it would be daytime, so they're not going to see it in the daytime. But if you go to the closest horizons where it's still night, you would have what is current day the Indian subcontinent. We have historic reports. I have a video on this, your brother can share it with you, which talk about those oral and written traditions in India that talk about a king of India that saw this. And later, when the companions and the later Muslims went to India, he mentioned this and he accepted Islam and he built a mosque. Now, we in Hadith science have a very strict, like I said, how we verify history is very strict. Indian oral history and things like that was not, could not be taken to our standards, but in what is acceptable of the Indian historic records, we have this. Meaning non-Muslims in India also saw the spreading of the moon and later accepted Islam. They built a mosque that still stands. Okay? So now, with all that evidence from foes and friends of different geographical locations, so that what we can be checked and verified in Hadith science and others, the question would be, how did he split the moon? Right? Would you not say that is of miraculous nature? Yeah. So, if the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a messenger, right? if what was given to him from the Quran, he could not have known scientific facts, prophecies, historical things. And if the miracle that physically happened with him were true miracle, he didn't try to uh, benefit off it from a financial perspective. He died, peace and blessings be upon him, and all he had was a cloak, a bowl, and you know, where, where he's the map that he sat. Like a life spent never accumulating wealth, right? So wouldn't you say that's a true messenger? You're getting it, right? Alright, watch the video. Your brother's gonna share it with you, alright? And then inshallah we'll continue. Right. Any other questions? Okay. Anybody that's, else? That's just kind of cool, like the comparisons. Yeah, like, like, like we believe, like like the LDS believe, like like there's Joseph Smith. Stuff. There's like uh, yeah, there's like Joseph Smith. Yeah, a bunch of witnesses. It's just kind of cool to see the similarities. But I, I have yeah, read. For, uh, I have a Book of Mormon. I've read it. I have a lot of the writings of Brigham Young. I've read through this as well. Uh, and there's a lot of things that we we'll find similarities to. Yeah, that's cool. Excellent. So you're gonna watch the video about the splitting of the moon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fast <laughs> <laughs>
Are you done? That's it? I think so. Yeah, sit down. Oh, you want me to move the camera back? No, no, no. This way. No, no, I don't want to be in it. Just want to say something. Okay. <laughs> he got the camera. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala First, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for facilitating such a wonderful gathering. And then second, I thank the guests for coming and making themselves available to ask their questions and, and uh, engage with us to learn about our beautiful religion of Islam and to build the bridges. But also, I would like to thank Sheikh Uthman Allah. He's been implanted in this seat for over two hours, you know, asking, answering, engaging. And uh, this is, by the way, tiring. It's not like uh, it takes a toll on you, you know. And he could go, I, I guarantee you, he could go on for another hour or two, you know what I mean, if needed. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mark the scale of the feet. Wallahi, I love him for the sake of Allah. I'm sure you do too. You know what I mean? May Allah reward him tremendously what he's doing for the Ummah along with his team. You know, it has, it has, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man la yashkur Allah, man la yashkur al nas, la yashkur Allah. Whosoever does not thank the people, he does not thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all have our shortcomings from conveying the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of us. But the least we could do is support those who do. The Shaykh mentioned something that is absolutely important last yesterday in the khutbah. That if the dua is the, the least, don't think it is least, it is being bad. You know what I mean? Dua is powerful. Dua is not something that is light. Dua is not something that is, it's silah al-mu'min. It is actually the weapon of the true believer. Yeah. If you keep him in your dua, and, team, and his team in his dua, this is your help in the dawah. But also, share his videos, share his contacts, share his websites. And I say his, he's but part of that big puzzle, puzzle as well, too. to be fair, you know what I mean? There are so many different people in the back. And you see them here with us, and others that they are not here with us, they would love to be with us, but they couldn't make it. There, are, it's a team working together. So here I'm asking you to, let's be a team to work together to do the same thing. Let's, same, that doesn't mean we're competing from the aspect of the same level. We can't get to that level, you know. We ask Allah to get us to there, you know what I mean? Jesus passed us. No, no, Allah, subhanAllah. But at least, let's work together to start something, you know what I mean? Let's work together to convey that beautiful message of Islam. There is nothing, nothing like it. Wallahi al There is nothing like its beauty. Nothing, nothing like its sweetness. Nothing like its rationality. Nothing like it is straightforwardness. Nothing like it is, it, it, it complies, rather the natural disposition complies with it. Nothing. There may be some stuff that are puzzling, perplexing, yeah. But at the end, if you take a look at it, Islam has it right. SubhanAllah. So if you know you are right, wouldn't you want those neighbors, the one you care about, those friends, you, those colleagues that you talk to and you hang out with, wouldn't you like them to taste that? When you go out, when you go out and you taste a good meal and then your next day is, oh, I went to that restaurant. That place has the best steak. You got to go there and try it. And this is just food that you get to pass on later on. Imagine about conveying something that is feeding you spiritually, which is the highest level. So I hope the visit of the Sheikh and his brothers, and our brothers, be a motivation for us, like a spring for us to move forward. I see a lot of capable people, mashallah. We've studied a lot. Let's put it to actions. If we just study and study and study and then don't do work, this is contrary to the study. The scholars even have said, 
that the, those who learn and don't act upon it are the first people in the hellfire. وَعَالِمٌ بِالْعِلْمِ لَمْ يَعْمَلَنْ مُعَدَّبٌ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَبَادِ الْوَثَنْ And a scholar with his knowledge, he did not act, he will be punished before the idol worshippers. We learn it. We, we know what Tawheed means. We know what it entails to establish it. Convey it. That which you know you convey. That which you don't know, I don't know. And it's not bad for us to say, I don't know. It is not bad. You, your credibility goes up. Because if you know everything, for sure you don't know anything. Your credibility goes up. Saying, I don't know, it's, it's, it's Imam Malik, Allah, people will come to him from Maghrib, far away. It will take them a period of time before to get to Imam Malik to ask him so many questions, he'll answer three and four. And then they'll say, well, <laughs> man, we came from Morocco area and, and you know, I'm coming to uh, uh, Medina and, and uh, we are asking you, and you, what do we tell the people? He said, Qul, Malik doesn't know. Who do you want me to tell the people? Well, I'm going to be held accountable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That should be your fear. But that does not, should not be the fear of you not giving da'wah. That should not be the fear to give that. No, give that with that which you know. Because that which you don't know, you cannot give. It's as if you do not have that, if you don't have the money. Can you give money? No. The one who does not possess something cannot give it. But that which you know, convey on my behalf one ayah, one ayah. But know the ayah, know the ruling of the ayah, know what comes in the ayah, what the scholars say about the ayah, convey it. They ask a question about it, do it. You don't know, I don't know. And that is not shameful, rather it is noble. So inshallah ta'ala, we're going to create a group where we're going to go ahead and, and, and uh, uh, do on a volunteer. It's all volunteer. We do everything volunteer. They do everything volunteer. Nobody gets paid for anything. We are not pocketing money. Nobody's pocketing money. And we spend for the sake of Allah rather than take. This is how we like it. The upper hand is better than the lower hand. We've always been like that. This is the da'wah of the prophets and messengers. This is noble. You are honored. And, and the Sheikh could tell you about the importance of tashrif and taklif between and the great beauty that the scholars have talked about, about this, how it gives you nobility and honor and lofty status. Yeah, you let you do the least. Takhfif. Ayah. Ayah. You want to tell me you don't know an ayah? But the problem is we shy away from our Muslim identities. We shy away. You see somebody, a brother that is named Muhammad, you ask him, what's your name, brother? Uh, Mo. Mo? Mo? Subhanallah. You have the most beautiful name of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the, the most beloved creature to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And you say, Mo? And you see people like, oh, can I pray at home? Why? Oh, uh, I just can't, I'll get fired. No, I don't. Tell them, they'll get you a room. Wallahi, I can't, I can't come. Why can't you come for Jum'ah, brother? Well, uh, they just, I don't want to answer them. Two hours off lunch, it's, uh, they want, no. ask them. Did you ask them? <laughs> The problem is that they don't ask and they assume the questions and they act upon it like it's a revelation, subhanAllah. And that's dangerous, Wallah. That is absolutely dangerous. If they refuse, I don't say quit your job, but look for another job and when you get it, quit that job, no doubt. Because if you leave something for Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will substitute it with something that is better. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so many verses in the Quran, Don't think that they are going to sustain you. Allah is sustaining you. Don't think that your life depends upon them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, 
لا يرزقكم كما يرزق الطير يقضو خماصة ويروح بطانة If you rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he deserves to be relied upon He will give you sustenance just he gives sustenance to the birds They go out early in the day hungry they come back at night full But rely So please my beloved brothers we need to one of the reasons that it is allowed for you to be in this land, one of the reasons, is you have to give down. You have to give down. How could you love your neighbor and you don't tell him? How could you love your friends that you hang out with, buddy, buddy, play basketball with, and all of that, hang out, football, so on, PlayStation, night and day, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, well, I'm shy, I shy away from telling him how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or convey the true message of Islam and the purity of monotheism. How? Don't you love for them what you love for yourself? Isn't that the beauty of Islam? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost to grant us sincerity in our hearts and our actions. And once we have sincerity right to Allah, Allah will facilitate. And if you succeed, so be it. If you fail, the reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not losing. Wallahi, you are not losing. The reward with Allah. You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to let your action just go to waste? That means you think badly of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنَا عِنْ عَبْدِي بِي And I'm in accordance to how my servant think of me. Think of him good, he'll treat you good. So just... Please keep that in mind, my beloved brothers. May Allah reward you tremendously. Again, I just wanted to thank the Sheikh. May Allah preserve him tremendously. And the brothers for coming and honoring us with their visit. And inshallah ta'ala, I'm telling you right now, that would not be the last time. And uh, he will be coming more. And we'll be cooperating more upon righteousness and piety. Upon the Quran and the Sunnah and the understanding of the righteous predecessors. Because this is the only way a person will be saved. The only way a person will be succeeded. The only way he'll attain the sweetness of this life and the hereafter. <coughs> Jazakumullah khair, barakallah feekum. But my beloved son over here has a question. And I'll let Sheikh Uthman answer it. How do I know how to do da'wah in school, barakallah, come sit here. Come sit here. I'll put some time here. Come sit here. Hey. MashaAllah. First thing, what's your name? Salah. Salah. MashaAllah. Salah al-Din. Salah. MashaAllah. Barakallah. A great question from our young brother. How to do da'wah in school? First and foremost, through your akhlaq, through how you're a good student through being having good manners and showing that you are Muslim. So when in school they ask you, why don't you eat this and it's something haram, you say, I'm a Muslim, I don't eat the haram. When your friends tell you to lie, then you tell them, I'm a Muslim, we don't lie. When you use good behaviors, you act good with your school students, your teachers, that is your first doubt. Then above and beyond that, when you talk to your friends in school, your coast students that are there, you tell them I'm a Muslim, you tell them Allah is the one that created us, that one Allah that made us, the one that gives us life. And you tell them about Islam, this is your da'wah. You ready? Allah Akbar. Allah make it that you become the means of hidayah for your schools and your teachers in all of Salt Lake and Ogden and Utah and the world. Okay? Ameen. Jazakallah khair. I just, I, please don't shy away from questions. You have him now, okay? The opportunity like this doesn't come by often, okay? You have a question, don't shy away. All of a sudden, I sit here and I get 20 questions, okay? <laughs> I, I'll rather be on his shoulder than mine, honestly. So, if you have a question, please do. If not, Inshallah, we're going to pray, Inshallah ta'ala. And then you can ask me a question privately. Inshallah. Any questions? Going once? Tadda, Ali. Number one. I'll ask an Arabic or translation. Khalas, Tadda. We are 
الاسلام انه عيسى رفع الى الله نعم المسيحيين والكلام يقولون الرب رفع الى الله لكن كابنه كابنه صح فبدنا نفسر لهم او نوضح لهم وين الصح يعني حياكم الله ويا بالعربي ولا بالانجليزي؟ اول شيء بدي اسال طيب خلاص The question he asked is We as Muslims believe that Jesus, Isa ibn Maryam, he was raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, Many Christians also have the belief that he was raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the difference, as he mentioned, is that they would say as the son of Allah. So, what is the difference to clarify the stance on this? أول الفرق بين العقائد في الإسلام وما يقولون يعني يقولون نحن المسلمين أو النصارى هكذا. The first thing to clarify the difference in the Muslim belief and what is believed by many of the people who call themselves Christians and so on is نحن لم نقول هو ابن الله لم يلد ولم يولد. We do not say that he is the son of Allah. We say as Muslims. That Allah is not born from anybody or to nothing is born from him. He has no children and he is not the child of anybody. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than that. The relationship of spouses and children and brothers and sisters and fathers and stepfathers, this is the relationships of humans. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. If somebody was to say that Jesus was the son of Allah, then who's Joseph, the son of the father, the husband of Mary? That would be the stepfather of Jesus. So then God has a son with a stepfather. How would you be a stepfather to God? And if Allah, na'udhu billah, the kalamini, from what they say, is the father of Jesus physically, then when was the marriage of God with Mary? Was God having a son out of wedlock? Na'udhu billah. And if Jesus, according to what they say, is the son of God, where is the father of Adam? Right? If they say that this means he is the son of God, then who's the father of Adam? And who's the father of Eve? How many kids does God have? Does he pay alimony? Is there child support? This is ridiculous. We as Muslims do not believe this. We believe Allah is above those types of relationships. Yes, we believe Jesus was born to a Virgin Mary. In the beautiful ayat that Shaykh Ahmad recited earlier, yes, we have this belief. But we believe that does not make Allah the Father of Jesus, rather the Rabb, the Lord of Jesus, as Allah is the Rabb of Adam and Hawa, السلام, and the Rabb of all of us. And this is from the greatness of Allah, that He can create without a father or mother like the case of Adam or without a father or mother but from another group like the example of Hawa or without a father like Isa but Allah is Ta'ala, He is far above the creation we don't mix between them also the Christians believe that Jesus was killed before being raised and we do not believe that we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supported and protected his Nabi Isa ibn Maryam and he was raised, and we believe that he will come back, and he will live, and he will die, because What we find even in the writings of the Christians today, I will read to you a verse just so to be clear about it. This is in Acts chapter 3, verse 13. It says, according to Christians, we don't say this from us, this is from the Christian belief. The God of Abraham, and Jesus is telling them about God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus, who he have delivered. According to the Christians, Jesus said that he's a servant of God, Abdullah. Okay? So this is the Muslim belief that Jesus was a prophet, an Abd of Allah, a servant of Allah. And that we can still find in some of their scriptures till, till today. So that is the Muslim belief that is different from what Christian belief is called. Right? Any other questions?
I think we're Muslim, we can pray Dhuhr and come back. All of us Muslim. Thank you.